Hello friends, <coughs> uh, we are in the middle of the series on uh, mo modern European drama and we have discussed a number of uh, texts and authors uh, and uh, the uh, phenomena that they uh, presented and were a part of. Uh, today's lecture uh, by Professor Richa Bajaj who teaches English in uh, Hindu College, Delhi University uh, would be on uh, the playwright uh, Clifford Odets. He is an American playwright and uh, he belongs to the 20th century itself. So, he is going to be quite contextual for us, quite quite contemporary, uh, talking about our problems and uh, of course, the perspective would be his. And uh, as you would have noticed that uh, initially uh, American literature uh, in the 19th century was fictional or poetic and in the 20th century, uh, soon after perhaps the First World War, uh, in, in, a, in a great uh, amount of uh, you know effort, the writers started taking to the form of drama, and uh, many good dramatists uh, you know emerged in uh, American literature uh, in in that period, and uh, it's uh, we have not heard much about this particular playwright, so uh, it will be really uh, good uh, of uh, Professor Bajaj to have picked up uh, this particular uh, author. We'll know more about him, about uh, one or two plays uh, who are more important than others and uh, the curiosity is quite high. I will be asking questions from her uh, off and on because uh, th this is a playwright that we should be curious about uh, to find out what his stand is, uh, where he comes from, uh, what is his vision of culture, what is his vision of vision of society. All these things always remain alert in our minds and uh, we will definitely be conscious about them. So, uh, I request uh, Professor Bajaj to uh, give us an idea of the time, of the person, of, of, of the, the, the importance that he holds in the American theatre. So, please uh, start uh, your argument. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Prakash. I will begin by introducing this writer because as has been already noted that it is a lesser known playwright, but a seminal one because in a way he influenced the works of Arthur Miller and Tennessee Williams and Arthur Miller at one point actually said that we would wait for a Clifford Odette's play like we wait for hot cakes because then the plays would tell us what to think about ourselves and the times that we live in. So, uh, this is the kind of appreciation that uh, he received from writers like Arthur Miller. Miller and others of his time. So, he was quite, uh, he was a firebrand in many ways. Uh, he was the firebrand of American theatre and he often tried to radicalize the space or the revolutionize the space of American theatre which was till then a kind of using, but uh, particularly Broadway which was using, um, you know, a musical theatre and at the same time talking about a kind of frivolous, superficial sort of theatre and uh, which was all froth. So, he realized that um, it was important to turn Broadway into a or and he you know he would talk to uh, actors as well and um, uh, talk to them about the relevance of social kind of theatre that was the need of the hour. And plus um, this was the decade in the, the period of uh, the Great Depression really. It was the decade in this decade that he actually uh, wrote his first set of plays. So, they were directly influenced by the kind of restlessness that existed in society and he wanted to turn theatre into that kind of a space where conflicts could be, um, you know, projected in a more meaningful manner and some kind of solution could be seen on the stage. So, you know, this was his larger vision. But to give you a sense of what this writer is about, I would like you to turn to the screen and uh, take some notes on the introduction. So, he was born in 1906 in Philadelphia and interestingly born to Russian, Romanian, Jewish parents. You know, so uh, he's already, he, is, he has a kind of a um, view that is coming, you know, of a marginalized community, particularly the Jews. As you notice, even Jews are, when represented in his works, they are often uh, segregated and they're often, uh, you know, there is often prejudice against them. So, he is born to parents who have, you know, Russian, Romanian and uh, Romanian Jewish uh, kind of, um, you know, lineage. And so, when he's born, he, he, you know, so that kind of a history, that kind of a background remains with him. His characters also, when they speak, you know, they have a high, you know, they have some sort of a dialect that they use, you know, there'll be a Jewish sort of slant and there'll be a 
turn of phrase that would belong to a kind of a multi multicultural uh, world. So it's American, and yet you know he tries to tap into this kind of uh, street. Um, uh, vocabulary of the time, which is a mix of people from all places, right? So, uh, going back to his introduction, uh, he's born in 1906, but becomes a representative voice during the 1930s, you know, in America. The Depression years, really, which is often called the Depression year era America. Now, the decade was often hailed as the Red Decade. Uh, for the influence of socialism on the writers of the time. Now, that's very interesting. You will notice that this is the period when uh, there is a lot of fear around um, the influence of socialism that uh, in America and there are you know there are proper committees there are uh, proper groups that are active in society that are trying to eliminate such influences and uh, often people are you know termed or badged as red people so uh, there is this looming uh, kind of fear of this kind of uh, culture that is already making its way in uh, America especially at the time when America is seeing this kind of depression when when there is economically uh, when people are economically being pushed to the margins so you find that this uh, this fear looms large you know in uh, all of odette's plays and he tries to show this uh, that how uh, you know how people are turning restless and people are on the edge and they are about to break into some kind of a uh, uh, protest and how there is this fear and how this option is also available to them so these are some of the points that uh, one must keep in mind then uh, and as as i said he was the firebrand of american theater so he tried to uh, you know use this place as protest use this place for um, you know social thought social commentary etc so odette's plays really represented the harsh realities of day to day life he thought that his plays you know also rejected that kind of popular musical broadway theater which was all froth as i said earlier right so he he's bent on talking about so theater for odette's really uh, you know is the place of protest and it's the place of showcasing conflicts in society and and also showing their possible solutions the theater was not a place for him you know for distraction meant for distraction the theater was not a, some sort of an escape or respite from reality rather it projected a focused view of reality so you know that's where the change is that uh, theater is is not the place where you see often you found that people went to theater and the movies to distract themselves from their actual conditions to escape their kind of harsh reality what uh, or that tried to do here was to create that harsh reality on the stage for perception and a deeper engagement with the issues that uh, that were there behind that kind of uh, living so he didn't use theater to uh, just distract the audience or make them feel better or good about themselves rather he used uh, theater as a place of motivation and as a place of focus projection of reality so that's his kind of theatrical practice more than that he uh, you know he, um, when people went and watched his plays really they would uh, you know it's it, it's uh, it was mentioned in one of the anecdotes in introductions that when people went to uh, watch the plays the audience would actually look in the street further and discuss the plays they would not return home satisfied with the performance they would be uh, uh, unsettled and they would be uh, you know it, they would be thinking about the questions posed they would be actually feel motivated to take up a cause or so so that was the kind of uh, audience that he left uh, as the, uh, the audience was left thinking about issues and not uh, merely returning home uh, after a great performance or feeling good about themselves so in a way that practice itself was a different sort of a practice and what about entertainment art uh, what about you know feeling good when you go to the theater or were they uh, made to think the audience Yes, yeah, so uh, you see, there'll be humor in Odets. So mm -hmm. he'd he use humor, but again of a very uh, bleak kind. Humor again of the dark kind, you know, which would often remind you uh, of how people spoke. So if you hear, if you see a Clifford Odets play, you would actually feel you're hearing people, you people you know, talk on the street or people how people really talk. So uh, there, there, it's actually the speak of the ordinary pe speech of the ordinary people and how they would behave in circumstance. But there is, you know, there. there is this thing 
you know that that is there in each dialogue of his you know that the sting of something beyond what is being said no, so i i agree with you uh, uh, because uh, he is uh, uh, taking the audience into their own situations and and and, and their lives mm -hmm. and therefore they, they feel more interested in thinking about themselves yes but he doesn't leave it just thinking you know he compels them to act that people mm -hmm. feel angered or they feel completely uh, energized mm -hmm. you know after a clifford odets plays that you 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 are either totally uh, in the grips of that kind of a moment so he he's able to compel you to act uh, and compel you to uh, you know um, channelize that kind of passive sort of uh, uh, energy in you and bring that forward so uh, and uh, you know and and then there are these hidden meanings you know which are which otherwise and people people talk like that and yet uh, to be able to put them in a pattern uh, you feel that there is it, it never goes wrong and it ha it means more than what is really said in the moment that there is a, a deeper meaning behind what he is saying what the characters are saying so i think that's the unique quality of an odets place it doesn't mince words he is very clear on where he stands and he's um he's not trying to so it's not like a psychological deeply written play or so it's a very social oriented play what Sometimes does he want to change also, in society you see there are certain issues that he might take up and would like to change the society in, along certain lines uh, would you please tell us about the so, uh, issues he would take up so again you know he thought that what was basically going wrong with society at the time was not just that economically people didn't have money that was of course one very big reason that there was no money to be had at, at home mm -hmm. and people could not survive so livelihoods were uh, you know really stretched in that sense and people uh, were um, uh, finding it hard to sustain themselves in this kind of uh, an environment and yet uh, what uh, odets really uh, you know projects here is that there has been a change in temperament and attitude of the people that um, you know that Uh, uh in one of his other plays awake and sing and you know there is this uh, grandfather jacob who says in my time the propaganda was god in your time the propaganda is success and fame so uh the idea that uh success has become the new mantra of life that you know people are driven by and he at one point says you know and in fact maybe this is a good uh point to actually use that quote of his it's one of the interviews that he gave and in in his interview or, and this is a very late interview in 1963 he, he gave this interview just 6 months before his death and he said you know uh, he commented on the state of affairs in america and he claimed that i find and i quote i find that our american world today lacks innocence lacks conviction of innocence <laughs> what what does it mean conviction of innocence this is a difficult word yes but, and, but, and but, but, he goes but, on to also explain innocence because innocence if you understand innocence then you will understand the conviction of innocence mm -hmm. so we might return to this but he says i find that our american world today lacks innocence lacks the conviction of innocence we are told we are picked up from the movies we pick up from the movies the techniques of ingratiation the technique of selling yourself of getting across which necessarily means that innocence goes and experience shrivels our souls and oh no, no which means that uh, he's he's talking more about the uh, aimlessness of people and they 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 are thinking only of success and uh, going up but they don't know whether uh, going up would actually be satisfying right no but going up is not satisfying because he says that you are really selling yourselves you're mm. losing out of innocence because the world has become uh, we pick up from the movies you know and he holds hollywood responsible for that in that sense that we uh, that we we pick up pick these up from movies you know that the techniques of uh, flattery of ingratiation of uh, selling yourself of of, of uh, and using it as a means of getting across and getting above society so that you've lost your innocence which is you know and he explains you know, since in that interview uh, in the manner in which emerson probably spoke of the term uncorrupted behavior so he says that innocence is that uncorrupted behavior it is innocence is without dishonesty without a lie and your best human instinct so he says that um, each man or each person in america today is bothered about one's own career and one's own job so one can cannot speak one's mind he says i would want each individual to be able to say what one wants to say and do what one wants to do and he says it is almost impossible in the world of this 
uh, uh, you know in the in the current world where you must flatter you must sell yourself you must uh, uh, do things that you would that 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 you know that that are that probably today would what we call networking for instance in our own world you know networking is important and that how you get a, a get ahead in life so he says that with that uh, you know you're you're being increasingly dishonest to yourself and you're increasingly lying every day so much so that you have actually left your best self behind and you have corrupted your own person so i think at one level it is about uh, the depression his plays and his vision as you asked me they are about the problems that america faces and you know he is also very uh, interestingly he tries to also present it humorously but it's almost like a dark satire that is, that the rich and the uh, and and the government uh, heads would not have them believe that they are living in a time which is uh, which is bleak which is dark they would tell them that all is well and that it is all going fine and it is all great and that you would they're still trying to sell the dream to them that uh, you know it's a progressive world and that you must progress in it so uh, and, and and you know and so there is a false narrative that is always that is being floated all around that there are the people at the top uh, and that that your your government your your president is trying to really work for you so uh, delusion is also another very important um, way you know uh, aspect of this reality that america people in america have been deluded and to believe in a narrative like that and i think that is what um, uh, odets plays try to do they they, they uncover that reality they try to take that uh, you know farce off uh, the farce that is presented on in hollywood or um in the musicals the broadway musicals you know that only spoke about the riches and uh, the grand life that they that people are supposed to have and partying and uh, men and women dancing so you know that's the kind of life that uh, the musical still still projected while life outside had changed so life was not the same in the 1930s as it was in the 1920s is he talking about the urban world mostly or does he also go to small towns and villages mostly talking about the urban, urban world, world the city world, yes. cityscape mm. really and how uh, people in the cityscape have been uh, you know given dreams and made to follow them and uh, or the, delis- the the disillusionment that has set in in this kind of so world so the market the shops the selling and buying the trade right uh, exchanges these these are right the, the, all the, the school uh, and the school boys who are growing up with a vision and who want who are enamored by cars and uh, you know who want to get that kind of life and who who are uh, taught competition and who are taught to compete and win and all of that so you know that's uh, you know and so that's that's the kind of world he projects really there, there, there is a comment on false education that is being given in the schools right in, in so sense. you know okay. they like uh, in in the golden boy he actually project projects this kind of boy who is who's who's enamored of the world of luxury cars and expensive cars and he says that the cars these cars are like poisons in my like are they are like poison in my blood Mm-hmm. so uh, you know that how they have been corrupted how their minds have been totally um, uh, taken over and 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 for a boy to actually realize that that the cars have really poisoned my blood so in that sense you know suggesting that uh, there is a kind of a very shiny world that is projected which uh, is which people aspire but then the truth is very grave for people uh, who are dealing with day to day uh que- you know questions of living and to be able to make money on a daily basis they don't know whether they'd get their next meal or not so that's also the kind of life that exists and then the overall narrative of leaders and politicians and thinkers who are giving them again false narratives of uh, whether they be union leaders in fact uh, that you know who are giving them false promises and false narratives of uh, that everything is hunky dory in that sense so i think that's the the kind of um, contradiction that emerges from this kind of uh, a picture you know that, that there are there are those who are becoming rich there is a section in society that is growing and becoming rich and they've been a, bil, been able to build offices like the hollywood uh, movies project and then the governments and the politicians and their say and the actual people and the ordinary people what they have to deal with how their lives are being um, you know fractured in that sense and how they are dealing with um, the the issues of inequality and uh, you know poverty in that sense so it appears that he is in a way anticipating the world that is going to come Uh, after a, a few decades where uh, everything like like today the, the world is totally driven by success totally dri- driven by trade and uh, cutthroat competition 
Yes, so it is, it began in America, it began with the turn of the century, right? At the turn of the century, as capitalism grew in society uh, in America, then of course this kind of a mantra and this kind of uh, um, a model was portrayed, right? And it, it worked till the 1920s, only in the 1930s when the depression era hit, right? Then it was in 1930s particularly that ideas of socialism appealed to Americans and that is what became a kind of anathema for uh, the uh, the Americans or the American leaders because na they had already pushed their society in the direction of capitalism and uh, already on the world stage there were there were countries that were turning socialist so in 1930s there was a real sort of a terror and a real possibility of America rupturing and turning revolutionary it is for this reason also called the red decade in America because 1930 is the period when a lot of uh, writers think that so socialism perhaps is the way out even the characters you know they said that we don't know what color I mean you can brand us as red or yellow or anything but we are black and blue beaten boys you know and that we have suffered enough and we know that this is what is required whether you call it red or not is not our problem so even when they don't know uh, that this is socialism or that is not they know that they need to uh, work for their betterment they know that their own lives cannot continue the way they have been and Odette shows this kind of uh, a narrative he shows this these kind of everyday lives but people who are ready to uh, already at the edge and are ready to burst in that sense so I think that's what and you know about his plays in his preface to the first collection of his six plays Odette said in uh, said that you know the plays will say whatever is to be said most of them have bones in them and will stand up unsupported so you know that's how he also projected his plays that I don't need to say much about them that they have bones in them and they will stand up so unsupported. Can, can you explain this phrase it's a good phrase yeah having bones in themselves yes mm. so there, again suggesting that there is enough material in them that speaks for themselves that and that is the beauty of an Odette's place even though you might say it is uh, at one level it might appear propagandist or you know that at certain moments will appear very propagandist or certain characters would speak in a manner that would uh, that would be uh, of that nature mm -hmm. and yet uh, the problems that it projects they are real pro problems and the dialogues you know they are all like punch lines they are all punch lines of uh, any uh, play that could have so you know each dialogue is a punch line in that sense so uh, that's why I said that you know there is enough material in the play itself uh, and, and short plays you know one act plays they can carry so much force uh, in that uh, period that you know it, it says a lot. Uh, just one scene in a play could have been a one a one one play in itself, mm -hmm. and that would convey what the entire play is also conveying. Mm -hmm. And he's of course experimenting with theater also um, in the sense that you know um, Odette's was a part of this group which was called the group theater. Now that's mm -hmm. the uh, that's the, that's that's the new experimental sort of uh, theater and I would also take uh, a couple of minutes to discuss the story of the uh, group theater. So uh, the uh, you know the group theater really um, was begun in 1931 by uh, you know these proponents Harold Clerman, Cheryl Crawford and Lee Strasberg. Now Harold Clerman is the most important of the lot for Odets because he was sort of a mentor to Odets and uh, Clerman uh, would often uh, you know uh, so Odets was an actor initially you know he wanted to get into theatre and act so he acted for Broadway, he acted for the Theatre Guild and he also acted for the group theatre. Now the group theatre came in 1931 as a way of uh, producing you know very challenging plays and not just amusing plays uh, they they thought that you know American theater wasn't really reflecting uh, uh, the or mirroring American society that it was a false narrative that was being projected in theater and that we had to write or come up with new scripts and new acting um, uh, orders through so that uh, theater itself turns a new leaf so these writers got together and they you know Harold Clerman in fact would often take lectures on um, the group theater uh, and uh, train uh, actors and others to critics to uh, look at theater differently so uh, it, it was meant to be a theater that stimulated the audience and also mirrored American life and to be able to write original Am American plays would you call it a theater of ideas then the, the, yes. the, the, the yes. writing that conveys ideas yes much yeah so it was a progressive theater group mm -hmm. and it was idea centric and it felt that uh, theater wasn't uh, actually really Realistic theater was being farcical 
and uh, theater was and especially Broadway was more musical and more uh, bent on just stories of uh, you know that were that didn't relate to actual conditions of people. So the group theater act, uh, and group theater actually grew in force because the Moscow Art Theater came to New York in the 1920s and it put up its own shows and which actually infused life in American uh, playwrights and actors and they try to reflect that, do what Moscow Art Theatre was doing. Uh, mm. You know, like for instance, the Cherry Orchard what was portrayed there and projected and they understood that it was portraying Russia of the time and so they felt that they, it was important and, and you know, uh, the group theatre tried to do something similar with uh, its own uh, in, in its own country. So Harold Clerman actually for a deeper view and a better understanding of it, he actually wrote a book in 1944 called The Fervent Years in which he actually speaks about the ethos of the group theatre and how it grew, about the story, about how there were just random three uh, uh, you know, actors, activists who got together and decided to uh, build a kind of a theatre group in their country. Uh, so I think that's, that's how it grew. And Clerman uh, then, you know, also trained Odets uh, in many ways and uh, Odets, uh, he forced him to, encouraged him to write plays and uh, also uh, Odets continued to train as an actor with the company and learned the, his playwright craft really uh, from the group theatre, um, uh, you know, uh, actors and playwrights before him. So that's the kind of, uh, you know, that's, uh, that, that's the kind of... Uh, you know, formative years of uh, Odets and how then he finally in 1930s uh, ventures into writing his own plays. One small query, uh, yeah. does he use the, the story in the play? Is there is it a kind of plot or is it just ideas and situations uh, and people are made to uh, think about those situations and then uh, decide to act? Uh, interesting, yeah. So there is no very tight plot mm -hmm. in the story. He's trying to be episodic. In fact, he uses, I'll discuss this more when we take up a specific play of his. I plan to take up uh, Waiting for Lefty, mm -hmm. uh, his play. And there maybe we'll be able to discuss it more. But yes, there is no tight plot and he tries to keep the threads loose in his plays. So uh, friends, uh, in this part of the discussion, uh, we have uh, come across a writer in America uh, who takes up situations, who gives ideas to people and who critiques the, the, the norms that, 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 that society has uh, accepted uh, in, in the early part of the 20th century and is critical of it. So in the subsequent discussion, uh, we'll be, uh, she will be taking up, uh, 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 Richa Bajaj will be taking up certain texts to uh, substantiate the points that she has already made. Thank you.